Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. I uh, understand that um, uh, while these lectures have been going on for a really long time, that this is the first time that one of these lectures has involved live demonstrations. And what that means, quite simply, is we're going to have some fun. Uh, we got some really cool stuff here. This banana has been sitting in some of this cool stuff for a while. And, uh, 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 you know, it just, uh, it's frozen so hard that it uh, just breaks into little pieces. But the top part of it isn't frozen at all. It's uh, really quite tasty. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess that shattered a little bit too much. <laughs> what a mess that's going to be when it thaws out. So, so what I'm going to talk to you about this evening for the next hour is time, Einstein, and the coolest stuff in the universe. Uh, as you heard, I'm from uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, we're part of a thing called the Joint Quantum Institute, a joint institute between NIST and the University of Maryland. And uh, I'm part of the uh, Laser Cooling and Trapping Group. And Gretchen Campbell, Paul Lett, Trey Porto, and uh, Ian Spielman are my uh, permanent colleagues there. And in fact, uh, most of them have uh, or, or are now at this uh, uh, program here at, uh, at the KITP. Here's a, a picture uh, just taken this summer. Uh, there's Gretchen, who was here a couple of weeks ago. Ian, who's here now. Uh, Trey Porto, who's here now. Paulette, who's, uh, who's over here. And a whole... Uh, panoply of people from all over the world, young people eager to uh, uh, contribute to this rapidly growing field of, uh, of, of investigation. And it's really a pleasure to work with all of these young people and these, uh, uh, these wonderful colleagues. Well, time, Einstein, and the coolest stuff in the universe. Well, so what does time uh, and Einstein, what do time and Einstein have to do with each other? Uh, well, uh, for one thing, uh, Time put Einstein on the cover of their magazine uh, as the person of the century. And I think it was a pretty good choice because uh, Einstein changed the way we think about all sorts of things. Uh, uh, the photoelectric effect was uh, what he got his Nobel Prize for. He probably should have had about five Nobel Prizes, but he got one, and it was for the photoelectric effect. And this was really foundational because after a century of physicists proving that light was a wave, Einstein said, yes, yes, but let's think of light as a particle. And that changed everything. It was the beginning, really, of thinking about everything as both waves and particles. And that led to quantum mechanics. And that led to almost everything that we think of as being part of our modern technological society. Einstein, 1905, same year, Brownian motion. He explained the fact that when you look at a drop of water and it's got some fine dust particles in it, they're jiggling around. And he said this is because the water molecules are banging into these dust particles that you can see, even though you can't see the water molecules, and causing them to jiggle. And he gave a quantitative explanation of that. And the verification of that was the thing that finally convinced most people that matter is made of atoms and molecules. 1905. A lot of people did not believe that that was the case. This is the thing that iced it for everybody, was Brownian motion. Uh, stimulated emission, the fact that this laser works, is based on the, uh, on, on the work that, that Einstein did. All sorts of other things. But probably the thing that Einstein is most remembered for is special relativity. Special relativity changed the way we think about space and time. Before Einstein, space and time were thought of as being an immutable stage on which everything else played out. And what Einstein showed us was that, uh, that space and time depended upon who was looking at them. And uh, one of the ways he came to that conclusion was by asking himself a question that is probably a question that people have asked themselves since the beginning of time, namely, what is time? What is this elusive thing that is always in the present but will soon become the past and will move us into the future? What is time? Well, Einstein came up with what I believe is a very profound answer. Time is what a clock measures. Now, you may think that that is a superficial answer. But in fact, by taking that idea seriously, Einstein was able to come up with some of his most important ideas about the nature of time and changed the way we think about both space and time. But if time is what a clock measures, then what is a clock? Well, a clock, 
uh, is something that ticks. And uh, at NIST, uh, making clocks, standards of time, is our business. And throughout history, clocks, these ticking objects, these things that give us a series of, uh, of events, of regular events, uh, have been getting better. Uh, and in the last century, NIST has played a major role in that. Probably the first clock is the rotating Earth. Uh, the Earth rotates, the sun rises and sets, people tick off days. As they became more sophisticated, they made uh, uh, sundials and, uh, and ticked off hours. Uh, much later, uh, uh, one day when Galileo was uh, uh, in the cathedral in Pisa and apparently not paying that much attention to the, uh, the service, he was watching uh, the chandelier, uh, uh, according to legend, and uh, discovered that the, uh, the, the period of the swing of the chandelier uh, was independent of how far it, it was swinging. And so uh, that was the beginning of a lot of things, but one of the things it was the beginning of was clocks based on pendula. And the familiar grandfather's clock or tall clock is one of the results of that. And these, uh, these clocks were marvelous uh, 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 devices, could keep very good time. Many of you are wearing a clock on your wrist. And uh, if you've got a quartz watch, inside that quartz watch is a tuning fork shaped crystal and the vibrations of that crystal are the ticking of your quartz watch. Now, throughout history, these clocks have not only gotten better, in many cases, they've gotten beautiful. Some of these clocks are not only marvelous works of engineering, but marvelous works of art. And here is one of my favorite clocks. This clock is imaginatively named H4. Uh, it is named that because it is the fourth clock that a man named John Harrison made in his lifelong quest to win the Longitude Prize. At the beginning of the 18th century, the British government offered a prize of 20,000 pounds for anyone who could determine the longitude to within some, uh, some accuracy on a voyage from Great Britain to the West Indies. Why? Because they were losing ships with thousands of sailors and millions of pounds of cargo because they didn't know where they were on the high seas. Now, latitude is easy. You just look at where the North Star is, how high it is in the sky, and that tells you your latitude. But longitude, how far east or west you are, that's not so easy. And Harrison said, I can do this by making a clock. A lot of people didn't believe it. People as famous as Sir Isaac Newton, who at that time was the royal astronomer, said, you're never going to determine longitude with a clock. But Harrison said, I can do it. Why does a clock uh, tell you what the longitude is? Well, you know, if you call somebody on the East Coast, it's later there, right? And if you call somebody in Hawaii, it's earlier there. And uh, of course, back then, you couldn't call anybody anywhere. Uh, but how would you know what time it was in Greenwich, for example, where the zero of longitude is? Well, if you had a clock that you set to noon in Greenwich and you took it with you, you would always know what time it was in Greenwich if the clock was good enough. A pendulum clock is not going to work on a 18th century sailing vessel. So Harrison had to make a different kind of clock, and this was the clock that he made. And in trials in 1762 and 1764, he satisfied the, uh, the conditions for the prize. His clock was good to 39 seconds. It had to be good to two minutes. It was good to 39 seconds over that 47-day voyage. Today, almost any quartz watch is better than H4. This is the kind of changes we have seen in, uh, in timekeeping. But all of these clocks, Harrison's clock, your quartz watch, even the rotation of the Earth are imperfect. The length of a pendulum may stretch or shrink, and that will change its swinging period. Every quartz crystal is a little bit different from every other one, and the ticking rate might change with temperature or humidity. Uh, whether you're wearing it on your wrist or whether you're keeping it on, a, on a, a bedside table. Even the rotation of the Earth is slowed by things like the tides, changes in ocean currents, storms. The fact that the Earth's rotation is not constant was made clear to me in a rather dramatic way one day when I was visiting the U.S. Naval Observatory. The U.S. Navy is interested in time for much the same reason that the Royal Navy was interested in time in the 18th century, in order to navigate. And we'll hear a little bit more about how that navigation is done with clocks in a moment. But uh, as I was uh, walking along with one of my colleagues who was going to show me the latest clocks, 
uh, that they had at the Naval Observatory, we passed by a door on which was written, Director of Earth Rotation. <laughs> Quite a responsibility. Uh, <laughs> You wonder what happens if he goes on vacation. Uh, <laughs> I actually thought that uh, was a different, anyway. Um, so, so there's somebody there who has to keep track of this stuff because people who still want to uh, know about uh, uh, the positions of the stars uh, want to know what, uh, what the latest is on the Earth's rotation. Uh, so all of these are imperfect tickers. The best tickers are atoms. Why are atoms tickers at all? Well, uh, atoms have uh, internal vibration frequencies that correspond to differences in energy levels in, in, the, uh, in the atom. And so as a result of that, you can use these energy levels, these vibrational frequencies of, of the atoms in order to make a clock. And the reason is that you can have radiation that has some frequency. It might be microwaves or it might be light, but it oscillates at some frequency. That's all that radiation is. It's, it's an electric and magnetic field that is shaking back and forth at some frequency. If you listen to the radio, AM is about a million times per second. FM is about a hundred million times per second. Microwaves, the stuff that cooks your dinner, uh, a few billion times per second. Okay? Well, a uh, typical ticking frequency uh, for atoms might be about 9 billion times per second. If you shine microwaves of exactly that frequency at the atom, you can make it change its state. And you can detect whether that happened, and that'll tell you whether you've got the right frequency. And you can use that frequency to synchronize a clock and tell people what, what time it is, how time is unrolling. So that's, uh, that's the idea of, of an atomic clock. But how good are these clocks? Well, a quartz watch that you would spend a good bit less than $100 for is good to about a part in a million. That means that it would gain or lose about 30 seconds in a year. It's a lot better than Harrison's clock. On the other hand, for $100,000, Wait a minute, for $100,000, you can buy an atomic clock that's good to a part in a million million. That's 30 seconds in a million years. Now you laugh, $100,000. But think about this. You pay a thousand times more money, you get a million times better performance. <laughs> Come on, that's a bargain. But you still might ask yourself, well, who needs a clock that's that good? I mean, after all, most of us don't need to know what time it is to the level of precision that an atomic clock might give you, or at least you may not think that you need to know what time it is to that level of precision. I uh, found this uh, advertisement in a, uh, in a magazine once, um, an advertisement for a high-end car. And it says, you get in trouble, relax, help is only 10,000 miles away. The 10,000 miles referred to is the orbiting altitude of a constellation of satellites, 24 satellites that make up the global positioning system, the satellite navigation system. And on each one of those satellites, there are atomic, whoops, there are atomic clocks. Ah, dang. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so, so here's these satellites. Each one of those satellites has atomic clocks in it. And all of the atomic clocks in all the satellites are synchronized. And let's imagine just for a moment that you also have an atomic clock built into your little GPS receiver. Uh, you don't, but let's just assume for a moment that you do. And it is also synchronized. Okay? Now, every one of these clocks is radiating what time it is on board the clock. And they're all synchronized, so they're all at the same time. And they're also telling you where they are. And that's very accurately tracked because with wonderful clocks on board, it's really easy to track these, uh, these satellites, know exactly where they are. So you're sitting down here and you're receiving information about what time it is. They all have the same time on board, but it takes a certain amount of time for the time signal to get to you. It's amazing how many times time comes up when you're talking about time. Um, so that means every one of these satellites, because it's a different distance away, is going to be reading for you a different time. 
And all you have to do is look at the time you've got, the time that each one of the satellites says it is, and you know how far away each one of the satellites are. If you know how far away you are from three things, and you know where those three things are, you know where you are. Now, you don't have a clock. That's why you need one more satellite. So when you turn on your GPS thing and it says acquiring satellites, it's looking for four. As soon as it's got four, it's ready to go. If it's got more, so much the better. So that's how the global positioning system works. And it works because we have really, really good clocks. These atomic clocks are on board those satellites. What do these atomic clocks look like? Well, I found another ad in a magazine, uh, an ad for an airline company. And this uh, ad said that uh, they recently set the atomic clock in Braunschweig, Germany. I'm not sure why they chose Germany. We've got ours in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, uh, that they set it back one full second. That's true. That's to keep it in sync with the rotation of the Earth, which isn't uh, uh, constant. And so every half a year, they make sure that it's in sync with the rotation of the Earth. And every once in a while, they have to adjust it by a second. And those are called leap seconds. And they do do that. And the claim was, our flight schedules have been adjusted accordingly. <laughs> yeah, right. But. <laughs> The thing that I want to point out is that the instrument in front of which these two dorks are standing <laughs> looks nothing like an atomic clock. If you were to go to our laboratories in Boulder, Colorado, where we have the atomic clocks that keep time uh, for, the, for the country, you would see something that looks like this. Um, inside this long tube, uh, OK, maybe they don't have the sign, but it really does look like this. Um, uh, or at least it did up until a few years ago. So inside this long tube is a, uh, an atomic beam. First of all, uh, it's evacuated inside there. And there's an atomic beam. And that atomic beam uh, puts cesium atoms uh, down the tube at a velocity of about 200 meters per second, uh, close to the velocity of sound. And these clocks are incredibly good. They are better than one part in a hundred million million. In other words, they're a hundred times better than what you can buy, the kind of clocks that are here in the laboratory. But the atoms are moving so fast that they only stay in the apparatus for a few milliseconds. Somebody said, this is like trying to tell time from a clock that is whizzing past your face at the speed of sound and then crashing into the wall. That doesn't sound very easy, does it? But people have been working on this for 50 years. And after 50 years, they've gotten this so that the, the accuracy of these clocks is a part in 100 million million. But you know what? We're NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. That's not good enough for us. Our job is to do the best we can to keep up with the needs of a modern technological society. And we need better timekeeping. And what's the problem? The problem is the atoms are going so fast. Those atoms are going so fast that the speed of these atoms is the thing that limits how well we can tell time with a clock like this. Just because the atoms just don't stay in the apparatus very long, it makes it hard to measure them. There are other things that I wish I could have a time to tell you about things like Doppler shift and relativistic time dilation, what Einstein taught us about in 1905, all make it so that these fast atoms will not allow you to make a clock that is better than about a part in 100 million million. And we want to do better because we're NIST. <laughs> so what we're going to have to do is slow down the atoms. And slowing down the atoms means that we're going to have to cool them. Because the difference between hot and cold is the difference between fast and slow. If you've got a hot gas, for example, like the air in this room, and believe me, the air in this room is feeling kind of hot to me, the air in this room is made up mainly of nitrogen molecules. And the nitrogen molecules are moving around at a velocity of about 300 meters per second, about the speed of sound. No accident. Uh, if we could cool down the air in this room, it would mean that we would be making the atoms and molecules that make up the air move more slowly. So it's all about making things cold. So in order to illustrate for you just how cold we would like to get things, 
courtesy of the physics department here at the University of California, Santa Barbara, I brought along some really cool stuff. You already saw what happened with the banana. This stuff is liquid nitrogen. <laughs> it's a lot more exciting right here in the front row. This stuff is liquid nitrogen, basically liquid air, because nitrogen is the main constituent of the air. It is so cold that its boiling point is so much lower than room temperature that the floor on which I'm pouring the liquid nitrogen is to the liquid nitrogen like a red hot stove would be to water. What would happen if you pour red hot, uh, water onto a red hot stove? It boils. I've got more. <laughs> so this stuff is so cold. I mean, this may sound odd. So cold that it boils. That means its boiling temperature is so low that the, this, this uh, table that I'm pouring it out onto is so hot that it makes it boil immediately as soon as I pour it out onto the, uh, onto the table. Boy, so much for that rubber mat. <laughs> So if you've got something that's that cold, then it seems perfectly reasonable that uh, should you want to cool down some gas, that you would use it to cool down the gas to make the atoms and molecules move more slowly. So inside this uh, styrofoam bucket, I've got some liquid nitrogen. Let me just pour some more into here. OK, that's good. And what I'm going to do is to take a you know, traditional container for hot gas, uh, a balloon, and stuff it into this, uh, this bucket. Uh, well, let's not be satisfied with one. Yeah, that ought to fit. Uh, because the, uh, the, the atoms and molecules in this hot, uh, hot gas now in this balloon or as we in the Washington area like to refer to it as hot air, um, uh, if I can cool it down with the liquid nitrogen, then I can make the atoms and molecules move more slowly. And if they're moving more slowly, it should be possible to, uh, to make uh, measurements on them more easily and more accurately. Now, how can I illustrate for you just how cold this stuff is? Well, here is uh, uh, what we call a Dewar flask. This is a thermos bottle. Okay, it has been sitting out here in the room for hours. It is at room temperature. That means that compared to the liquid nitrogen, this thing is red hot. Imagine that I had a metal bucket and I heated it up until it was glowing red, and then I poured cold water into it. What would happen? Well. The water would boil. And that's what's going on here. So let me just set that aside and let, the, uh, uh, let it boil away. And, uh, and, uh, and while it's boiling away, let's uh, cool down some more gas. Because after all, uh, the, uh, the atoms and molecules in this hot gas are moving around so fast uh, that it's hard to measure them. And if we can cool... Uh, if we can cool them down, then it should make it easier to, uh, to measure them. Well, the boiling of the, uh, of the liquid nitrogen inside this, um, uh, this Dewar has subsided. An awful lot of it has boiled off uh, in the process of cooling down the, uh, uh, the Dewar. So let me just refill it here. And now uh, what I want to do is to take... Uh, this uh, this flower, this this nice uh, uh, set of carnations. This flower was gotten fresh today. It's nice, nice fresh flower, uh, and it's been sitting out at room temperature. That means that the temperature of this flower, compared to the temperature of the liquid nitrogen, is red hot. The flower is actually red. Um, so imagine taking a fireplace poker and heating it up until it was red hot and then plunging it into a bucket of cold water. What would happen? Well, it would cause the water to boil. And that's what's happening here. You can see it boiling away. Right? So let's th set that aside while it uh, uh, cools down the flower. <laughs> what? <laughs> and let's 
cool down some more gas because you know I mean if you're going to do an experiment you want to be sure that you got plenty of stuff to uh, to work with and we want our gas to be nice and cold so that the uh, the atoms and molecules will be moving more slowly so that we can make better uh, better measurements right okay there we go okay great now we have our our flour and as you can see the boiling has pretty much subsided. That means the flour is now down to the temperature of the liquid nitrogen. This flour is frozen so hard that I can crush it like it was made out of porcelain. This stuff is really, really cold. <laughs> and if you've got something that cold, then why not use it to cool down uh, your, uh, your, your atoms and molecules in, in the gas to make them move more slowly so that you can make better measurements on them. <laughs> what? OK, let's see. What else can we do to show you how cold this stuff is? Oh, here we go. Racquetball. Nice, nice bouncy racquetball. Everybody see this, how nice and bouncy it is? Okay. Let's dump this racquetball into a bucket full of liquid nitrogen. Uh, we'll just see what happens with that after a while. But in the meantime, uh, here is a nice rubber band. Okay? Now, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to dunk this rubber band into uh, this uh, bucket of liquid nitrogen. Now, the great thing about the physics department here at the university is they've got some doers that are clear. Now, the trouble is that clear doers don't work nearly as well as, uh, uh, as uh, ones that are silvered, but it means that you can see through them. And I have to wipe the, uh, uh, the condensation off the thing. But when I dunk this uh, rubber band into the doer, you're going to be able to see that it makes the, uh, the liquid nitrogen boil. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave it in there for a few seconds until the boiling stops, which is pretty much the case now. The boiling has pretty much stopped. When I pull this rubber band out, it's frozen so hard that I can break it like it was a dry twig. This stuff is incredibly cold. But let me just point out that when I warm it up in my hands, it's a nice stretchy rubber band again. This stuff is really, really cold. And if you've got something that cold, <laughs> then you know why not use it to cool down your your atoms and molecules so that you can make uh, uh, them move more slowly, so that uh, you can make better measurements, which is the whole idea, to be able to to uh, to make uh, uh, better measurements on the atoms and molecules, to um, uh, make better atomic clocks. Let's see what else can I do. Ah, uh, yeah, here we go. <laughs> So, over here, I've got a plastic soda bottle. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour liquid nitrogen into the plastic soda bottle. And I'm going to put the lid on. And I'm going to put the lid on really tight. Now, your mother always told you, never ever take a closed container of liquid and put it in the oven. Now, compared to the liquid nitrogen, this room is an oven. And so I'm going to put this closed container of liquid, doing what your mothers always told you you should never do, into the oven. And we will see what happens. <laughs> In the meantime, let's see what has become of our, uh, of our racquetball. Remember the nice bouncy racquetball that we had before? Uh -huh. <laughs> and let's see how it bounces now. It broke into 
a whole bunch of pieces like it was made out of porcelain. This stuff is incredibly cold. And, you know, if you've got something this cold, then why not use it to cool down your atoms and molecules? Well, okay, how cold is this stuff? Well, remember, physicists like to measure temperatures up from a, uh, a temperature that is the lowest possible temperature that you could have. We call that absolute zero. Now, why is there a lowest possible temperature? Well, look at what it means to be hot and cold. Cold means that the atoms and molecules are moving more slowly. What's the slowest you can go? Slowest you can go is stopped, right? So when the motion of the atoms and molecules stops, then it means you're at absolute zero. Now, it turns out that because of things like quantum mechanics and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, uh, the motion doesn't actually stop at absolute zero. But you know, just among friends, let's say that absolute zero is when the motion stops. Okay, so there is a coldest possible temperature. Now, measured up from this coldest possible temperature, room temperature where we are right now is 300 degrees. The melting temperature of ice on that scale is about 273 degrees. The coldest temperature that has ever been measured anywhere on the face of the Earth for a, an air temperature, 185 degrees above absolute zero someplace in Antarctica during the winter. That's colder than the temperature of dry ice. 185 degrees, the coldest temperature ever measured for an air temperature anywhere on the face of the Earth. This stuff that is so cold that it boils when you pour it out onto the, uh, onto the ground, so cold that it makes uh, racquetballs shatter like they're made out of uh, porcelain, that, that allows me to shatter uh, uh, flowers, that is so much fun. <laughs> How cold is it? 77 degrees above absolute zero. 77 degrees above absolute zero. Unless you have been in a cold, in a low temperature physics laboratory, this is probably the coldest stuff you've ever seen. 77 degrees above absolute zero. And when you've got something that cold, then why not use it to um, uh, cool down a uh, gas so you can make the atoms and molecules move more slowly. And that's what we've been doing by putting these balloons into the, uh, the liquid nitrogen. But I believe that some of you have noticed, perhaps the more astute among you, that the volume of the balloons that I put into the bucket uh, exceeded the volume of the bucket by a good bit. And why is that? That's because these balloons are flat as pancakes. These things are Frisbees. Now, uh, so does anybody know how many balloons I put in? Does anybody, you remember the colors of the balloons that I put in? Blue and purple and, you see, that's what, what kids will tell you. Now, I want to, want to ask you to remember, how many white balloons did I put in? How many red balloons did I put in? You know, there's another white one. There's another red one. There's another red one. I could have put balloons, in. I, I loaded it up with balloons before we started, see? I could, have, I could have been putting balloons in until the cows come home. Uh, because they're... Whoa! <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> don't, don't ever put a closed container of liquid in the oven. Your mother was right, as she always has been. <laughs> don't ever put a closed container in an oven. This... Just one more illustration of just how cold this stuff is because putting it into the room is like putting it into an oven. But the point of all of this with the balloons is that the balloons collapsed. They turned into pancakes. And that is what always happens if you take a gas, put it into a container, which is the way that's how we refrigerate things, right? We put something into a container and you make the container cold. 
by putting it in contact with something else that's cold. That's how you cool down your, your, uh, your, your soda in, in a refrigerator, right? Well, if you do that with a gas and you make this thing cold enough, then it's going to condense into a liquid or a solid and you will not have a gas anymore. And if you don't have a gas, you're not going to make a good atomic clock because this perfect ticking frequency that is the same for every atom of the same type in the entire universe, as far as we know, it's not going to be the same if the atoms are stuck on to other atoms. It's not going to be the same if they're stuck on to the inside of a container, like the inside of the balloon, or any other kind of box you have. You're not going to be able to get your gas atoms cold by this kind of conventional refrigeration. You're going to have to do something else. Basically, you're going to have to learn how to cool something without touching it. And that's what the rest of the story is about. But there's another point. And that is, this liquid nitrogen is incredibly cold. It's wonderfully cold. I mean, it's just so fantastic. I mean, it boils. When you pour it out of... Oh, dear. But I have more. <laughs> it boils when you pour it out on the ground. Have you all seen this? It's just fantastic. This is just great stuff. I mean... <laughs> This stuff, I mean, it's the coldest stuff. This is the coldest stuff you've ever seen. It's, 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 uh, you know, and it, it's wonderful that the humidity is about 100% right now because it makes this marvelous cloud. This is just water vapor condensing out of the air. It's an ordinary cloud that we're seeing here. And, I mean, this is the coldest stuff you've ever seen. The, the molecules that are boiling off of the floor when I pour the liquid nitrogen out are coming off at a temperature of about 77 degrees. That means their velocity is about half as fast as the velocity of the, the molecules in the air, which is about at 300 degrees, because the velocity goes like the, uh, the square root of the temperature. So they're, they're moving half as fast, about 150 meters per second, a factor of two slower, half as fast as the, uh, as the molecules in the air. Well, you know, a factor of two isn't bad to, to make something half as fast as it would be at, at, uh, at room temperature. But you know what? I have been working on making gases cold for over 30 years. I have not devoted 30 years of my life to make half-fast atoms. <laughs> what I wanted to do was to make things that are really, really cold. So how are we going to do that? Well, the answer to how we're going to do that, in a certain sense, has been staring at us from the heavens for centuries. Because since the time of Kepler, people have known that the tails of comets always point away from the sun. So if you have a comet coming in from somewhere out in the Oort cloud and it heads in toward the sun, the tail streams behind it. It goes around the sun and goes back out and the tail streams in front of it. And the reason is that the comet is made up of frozen gas and dust and the the sun heats it up, and then the sunlight pushes the dust and gas away. There's solar wind that's also acting, but the point is that light pushes on stuff. And what we're going to do is use the pressure of laser light pushing on atoms to push on them and make them go more slowly. And if we can make them go more slowly, that means that we've cooled them down. But wait a minute. Lasers are supposed to heat stuff. Right? I mean, this is a laser welding uh, operation. It heats things up, right? How are you going to shine light on something and make it slow down, make it cool down? And in order to understand that, there's two things we need to know. Uh, one is uh, about resonance in atoms. A gas of atoms typically is going to be transparent to light. If the light goes right through the gas, there's not going to be any force on the atoms. Only when the atoms absorb the light will they feel a force. And only if the color is just right will the atoms absorb the light. Now, there's no color in the visible part of the, uh, of the spectrum of, of light going from red to blue that is absorbed by air. But there are other gases like sodium. Uh, you've seen these yellow street lamps? Uh, they've got sodium gas inside. The, that gas will absorb the yellow color that comes out of it. If you take a laser and shine it into a gas of sodium atoms and you tune the laser so the color of the light coming out of the laser is just that yellow color, it will be absorbed by those sodium atoms and give them a push. But the color has to be just right. Now, color is just a measure of, uh, of the frequency of the light. Remember, all radiation is just uh, electromagnetic 
electromagnetic waves shaken back and forth at some frequency. Light is really, really fast. It's uh, almost 10 to the 15 cycles per second. That's what, a thousand million million, I think. <laughs> okay, there's probably a name for that number, a gazillion. Anyway, um, uh, uh, if you get the, the frequency, you've got to get the frequency right to 10 to the 7. That means you've got to get it right to a part in 100 million, approximately, in order for the atoms to absorb the light. That is such an incredibly small change in color. You would never be able to see a change in color. If you saw two colors that were different by a part in 100 million, you'd never be able to tell the difference between them. But the atoms are so exquisitely sensitive to the color that they can tell the difference. The color has to be resonant with the atom's frequency. The, the frequency of the light has to be resonant with the atom's frequency or will not absorb the light. That's the first thing. The second thing is the Doppler shift. What's the Doppler shift? Let's imagine you were on the, uh, the shore. You just go down to the beach and you see how frequently the waves hit the beach. Okay, so now you've got a wave frequency. Now you get into a boat and head into the surf. The waves are going to hit the bow of your boat at a higher frequency than they hit the shore when you were at, at rest on the shore. And if you turn the boat around and head into the shore, the waves are going to hit the stern of your boat less frequently. That's the Doppler shift for ocean waves. It works for all kinds of waves. If you have a light wave or a sound wave and you're moving toward it, the frequency is going to seem higher. That means the light is going to be shifted toward the green or the blue and the sound is going to be shifted to a higher pitch. You may have heard this uh, as you stand by the side of the road and you hear a car coming by and the sound goes something like <laughs> as the car goes by. Because as it's moving towards you, all the noise from the road is shifted to a higher frequency and when it's going away, it's shifted to a, uh, a lower frequency. Uh, same thing happens with light. Now we know enough to understand how laser cooling works. So imagine I've got a gas of atoms. In this simplified example, I'm just thinking about the motion along one direction, one, a one-dimensional. This is what theorists do all the time, is they simplify the problem to one dimension. Um, uh, and uh, so in this one-dimensional gas, some of the atoms are moving to the, to the right, some of the atoms are moving to the left. Because in a gas, the atoms are moving every which way, right? Now let's bring a laser beam in from the left and let's tune it so the frequency of the laser beam is a little bit lower than the frequency that the atoms like to absorb. Now if I'm this atom moving this way toward this laser beam, because of the Doppler shift, I see the frequency of the laser beam shifted up, which means closer to my resonant frequency, so I'm going to absorb that laser beam and slow down. Now, on the other hand, if I'm this atom moving in this direction away from this laser beam, I look back and say, I'm moving away. It's got a lower frequency. It was already too low, so I'm not going to absorb very much light. If I do, of course, it'll speed me up, but I don't absorb very much light because it's got the wrong color. Now, I can make this work better by bringing in another laser beam. And you see, this atom moving this way thinks this laser beam has the right color to be absorbed, and it slows down. Whereas this atom moving this way thinks this is the laser beam that has the right color, and it absorbs it. There's always a preference for absorbing the laser beam that will slow the atoms down if you tune the lasers below the resonant frequency. So now, if you get smart and you bring the laser beams in from top and bottom and from backwards and forwards, so no matter which way the atoms are going, they will feel that the laser beams that are opposing their motion are the ones that have the right uh, color to be absorbed. They will preferentially absorb those lasers and slow down no matter which way they go. It's as if the atoms are in a viscous fluid. Imagine that you were in a swimming pool full of molasses. If you tried to move, you would find that there was a force that opposed your motion. And so, when Steve Chu and his colleagues at Bell Labs first did this uh, in 1985, uh, they called it optical molasses, and the name sort of stuck. Um, so, if that was all there was to the story, then the atoms would just come to rest. But that's not all there is to the story because of what Einstein taught us in 1905, that we should think of atoms as particles. 
particles that we now call photons. And what that means is that when the atoms absorb light, they do it one particle, one photon at a time. So how does that work? Well, let's imagine that I'm an atom, and I just happen to be at rest, and there are laser beams coming from the, uh, from the, the left and from the right, and those laser beams have the same intensity and the same frequency. It'll be equally likely that I will absorb a photon from that side or from that side. It's just a random thing. Let's say I absorb a photon from that side. Boom! I get a kick. I go into the excited state. My electron is orbiting further from the nucleus. And I'm moving because I got a kick from that photon. If I'm a sodium atom, that kicks about three centimeters per second. Now, I'm excited, can't you tell? And I want to get rid of that energy. I get rid of that energy by shooting off a photon, boom, like I shot off a gun, and I recoil three centimeters per second, ready to absorb another photon, maybe from that side. Boom, I get a kick in this direction. I emit again, uh, maybe that direction, get a kick like that. Every time I absorb and emit a photon, I get a kick in a random direction. That heats the atom up. So there's a competition between the heating due to that randomness because of the fact that light is photons, and the cooling that comes from the Doppler shift that says anytime I start going in one direction, I'm going to have a force that, that tends to, to, to stop me going in that direction. I'll soon be going some other direction. So there's a balance between these uh, uh, cooling force and the, and the heating force. And you can calculate in just a couple of lines what the temperature should be as a result of this balance. The temperature is really low. For sodium atoms, which was the first atom we did these experiments with, 240 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. 240 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. This stuff, remember? The coldest stuff you've ever seen? Boils when you pour it out on the ground? 77 degrees above absolute zero. We're talking about getting down to 240 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. It's about 300,000 times closer to absolute zero than, uh, than the coldest stuff you've ever seen. You can bet people got really interested in that. If you could cool down sod sodium atoms to that temperature, the velocity would be 30 centimeters per second instead of the speed of sound. And in fact, the sodium atoms that are in those street lights are moving at about 1,000 meters per second because they're heated up. To, to, because you have to heat up sodium to, to turn it into a gas. So if you, could, if you could do this process without touching the atoms so they won't, uh, they won't condense, you could get them down to 30 centimeters per second. So we started to do uh, experiments. And uh, here is, after years of work, uh, here is a picture in our laboratory that shows laser beams intersecting. So these are laser beams intersecting in a vacuum apparatus that has some sodium atoms in it. And the place where they intersect is where the atoms get stuck in the optical molasses. That's about a centimeter across. There's about 100 million atoms in there. And the question is, what is their temperature? How are you going to measure the temperature of something that is supposed to be 240 millionths of a degree above absolute zero? You can't exactly take a thermometer and stick it up, you know. Uh, and the answer is, you use the fundamental understanding of what it means to be hot and cold. How fast are the atoms going? So uh, Steve Chu was the first one who, who, who did this. And uh, this is the way he measured the temperature. You put the atoms into the optical molasses. These are laser beams coming from every which way. And the atoms are in here, and they're jiggling around at whatever velocity they're at. That's what you want to figure out. And then you turn the laser beams off. Now the atoms don't feel this viscous force. They, only, they don't feel anything anymore because the laser beams are off. The atoms expand freely, just like a gas would expand in, in a vacuum, because they are a gas in a vacuum. And the hotter the gas is, the faster it expands. A few milliseconds later, a few thousandths of a second later, you turn the laser beams on. And whatever atoms are left in the intersection region are going to be stuck again. And you just measure the ratio between how many atoms you started with, how many atoms you end up with. And that tells you what the temperature is if you know everything else. And they did that. Well, you just have to measure what the, the, uh, the sizes of everything is and uh, what the mass of the atoms is. And you know, you know all that. Well, it's not easy. They made the measurement, and the measurement said it was 240 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. It's fantastic, because that's what the theory said was the lowest temperature you could get. 
That was the that was the cooling limit. First time out of the the, the starting blocks, you get the, the the record, the the lowest temperature you can get. We repeated those measurements a little bit later, got the same thing by doing exactly the same experiment in exactly the same way. We got the same answer, 240 millionths of a degree above absolute zero. And other people made similar measurements, and everybody was happy until we started to make more careful measurements about the behavior of the atoms in the optical molasses. It just wasn't behaving the way it was supposed to. It didn't have the right stickiness. It didn't depend on the laser uh, uh, frequency the way it should, or the laser intensity the way it should. We didn't understand what was going on. And so we decided to make more careful measurements of the temperature. because. These measurements were not very good because it was a really hard measurement to make. And so we made more careful measurements. And unexpectedly, in 1988, we found that the temperatures could be much colder than had been predicted. In fact, not just a little colder. In the very first measurements, we found that the temperature was six times colder than what the theory said was the lowest possible temperature. Now, of course, the whole idea was to make the atoms as cold as you could. We had made the atoms colder than we could. Clearly, this was a violation of Murphy's Law. And uh, we felt an awful lot like the poor devils in this uh, uh, cartoon, who obviously have seen something that is way too cold for the, uh, the environment that they're in. So having seen this proverbial snowball in hell, uh, we were a little bit frightened about announcing this to our, our colleagues. So uh, what we did was we, we developed three other methods of measuring the temperature. And when they all agreed, uh, we told people. And then it was clear that it was the theorist's problem now uh, because the experiments were written. And in fact, in, in Paris and in, in Stanford, they did experiments that confirmed our, our, uh, our experiments. And so it was clear we needed a new theory. And there were a lot of arguments about what kind of a theory was needed. Some people said we needed a theory with uh, less heat. And some people said we needed a theory of more cooling. And none of that actually led anywhere. Uh, but uh, in Paris, uh, Jean Dalibar and Claude Cohen-Tanucci uh, and at Stanford, Steve Chu and his colleagues figured out what was going on. And I wish I had time to tell you that story because it's a fascinating one. But guided by a new understanding of how laser cooling really worked instead of the simple version that I've given you, by 1995, we had been able to cool cesium atoms down to 700 nanokelvin, 700 billionths of a degree above absolute zero, 7 tenths of 1 millionth of a degree above absolute zero. Remember, this is the coldest stuff you've ever seen. Oh, dear. I've got more. <laughs> the coldest stuff you've ever seen, 77 degrees above absolute zero. Boils when you pour it out on the, uh, on, on the ground, on the table. We're talking about getting something that was 100 million times colder than the coldest stuff you've ever seen. If you go to the outer reaches of outer space, the temperature there, surrounded by the black body radiation left over from the creation of the universe, three degrees out there. We're four million times colder than the cosmic background radiation, which is arguably the coldest natural temperature in the universe. So unless there's physicists on some other planet somewhere who figured out how to do better, this at the time was the coldest temperature in the universe. The velocity of, of the cesium atoms at this temperature is less than a centimeter per second. Less than a centimeter per second. Remember, that cesium atoms are the atoms they use to make clocks. So uh, this, was the, uh, this was the atomic clock. 200 meters per second was the velocity of these cesium atoms. What kind of a clock can we make now that we've got atoms that are not moving at 200 meters per second, but at one centimeter per second? And the answer is no clock at all, because the atoms fall like stones. <laughs> I mean, look at it. If you've got anything that is moving at one centimeter per second, you let it go, it's just going to drop like a rock. Fortunately, uh, 50 years ago, a guy named Gerald Zacharias at MIT had the following idea. He said, if you had some cold atoms, which he didn't, toss them up in the air, well, in the vacuum, and uh, you can measure their, their, their frequency during this whole time of flight, going up and coming back down. And you see what, how wonderful this is? If I take something and toss it up a meter, instead of having it go sideways a meter, if I toss it up a meter, it comes back down after a second. So instead of only having a few milliseconds to make the measurement, you get 
a whole second to make the measurement. And so now, this is a picture of the atomic clock in our clock laboratories in Boulder, Colorado. So this is Don Meekoff and Steve Jefferts, and they laser cool cesium atoms down here. They shoot them up, they come back down after about a second, and this clock, and clocks like it in other laboratories around the world, are now good to 3 times 10 to the minus 16. That's accurate to one second in a hundred million years, and they're getting better all the time. My friends, this is what we call close enough for government work. And, and that's not all, because uh, in, um, in other experiments at, uh, at NIST, atomic clocks using laser-cooled ions that are using a ticking frequency not in the microwave but in the optical range, range of the spectrum are now good to 9 times 10 to the minus 18, a second in 3 billion years. But they're not cesium, so they're not really telling us what the second is. It probably means we will redefine what we mean by a second to use the better accuracy that these kind of clocks can give us. But now you might ask yourself, where are you going to store the coldest stuff in the universe. I mean, what are you going to keep it in? If you wanted to put the coldest stuff in the universe into a bottle, what sort of a bottle would you use? Imagine that this bowl is the bottle we want to put our, uh, our cold atoms into. Well, if the bowl is hot, then that means that the molecules that make up the, the bowl itself are jiggling around really fast at you know, the speed of sound or more. And uh, so that means if you put a cold atom in there, then it's going to be hit by the jiggling atoms of the bowl and heat it up and it's gone. On the other hand, if the bowl, bowl were cold, and I don't know how you'd ever get a bowl cold enough, we've already seen what happens, it just sticks. You don't have a gas anymore. So you can't use any kind of a container. Well, there is something you can do you can make something that is a container that doesn't have any material walls. When you were kids, good lord, <laughs> I didn't expect that to frost up the... Uh... Okay, so let me tell you a story about what you did when you were kids. <laughs> when you were kids, you played with magnets, right? Everybody plays with magnets. I still love to play with magnets. And one of the things you learned when you were playing with magnets was that if you oriented the magnets in the right way, you could push one magnet around with another one, right? Without touching it. Do you remember the first time you held two magnets in your hand and you turned them and so you could feel that force that was pushing them apart and they weren't touching each other? Isn't that amazing? I'm still amazed by that. Well, this is what we can do with, uh, with, with magnets. And since it turns out that our atoms are like little, little tiny magnets, we can use this magnetic force to hold on to our atoms. Let's go to the video uh, camera and switch over to, uh, to video. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you in a toy version. Where's our videographer? <laughs> Is on? Okay, great. Okay. So now, uh, okay, so, so what we're doing is this, this apparatus right here has a great big magnet in it. And here, I've got a little tiny magnet. And the idea is I'm going to try to make this little tiny magnet float above the big magnet. You might have tried this if you had enough magnets at home when you were a kid to arrange a bunch of magnets on a table and make another magnet float above it. Well, that's exactly what I've got arranged right here. Did it ever work? Not with ordinary magnets. And let me show you why. Because this magnet, the big magnet, is pushing up on the little magnet. And uh, right here is about where the force is balanced. And if I let go of it, it should just float. And when I do let go of it, what happens is it flips over and gets pulled down to the big magnet instead of floating. Now, it turns out that our atoms are not just little magnets, they're little spinning magnets. And one of the things you learned when you were a child playing with toys was that if you spin a top, it doesn't fall over. So I'm going to spin the magnet and that way it won't flip over. <laughs> okay, well, it should have worked better than that. But, um, 
but, uh, but that's the idea. Let's go to the, uh, 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 back to the, uh, the PowerPoint and let me show you a, uh, a movie. Uh, so this is a slightly better version of what uh, of what I just tried to to demonstrate, but uh, the temperature changed a little bit, and uh, so this is. Now I'm not hearing the sound, so let's get the sound on. But it doesn't really matter for this one, but for the next one it will. Uh, so this is doing exactly the same thing. Uh, you see this this levitated top, and it's sitting there levitated, and uh, and that's that's the toy version of how we hold on to our atoms, how we levitate them. Now. What we're going to do now, that's the toy version. Now let me show you the real thing. So this is, uh, this is uh, real atoms being trapped. Now, since then, we've made the vacuum a lot better. We can hold our atoms for a much longer time. And using this and using a new trick that was developed by our colleagues in other institutions, who I'll tell you about in a moment, a trick called evaporative cooling. Well, what is evaporative cooling? Evaporative cooling is just what you think it is. If you want to cool down your coffee, you blow on it. What's going on? What's going on is that the, the most energetic wa water molecules are escaping from the surface of the coffee. And that means that what's left behind has less energy and therefore is colder. That's why your coffee cools down when you blow on it. We're going to do exactly the same thing with our atoms. That is, we are going to allow the most energetic of our atoms to escape from this magnetic trap. So that's one of the reasons why we wanted to hold our atoms in a magnetic trap, so we could allow the most energetic ones to escape and keep the rest of them, which are going to be colder. And using this idea, our friends in Boulder, Colorado, at the NIST laboratories in Boulder, Colorado, got a sample of atoms and cooled them down and were able to do something that Einstein had predicted back in 1924. Einstein said, get a gas of atoms, make it cold enough and dense enough. And nobody had ever had a gas of atoms that cold and that dense. But he said, make it cold enough and dense enough and something wonderful will happen a large fraction of the atoms will simply stop moving. Which is, you know, what could be better than that if you want to make atoms go more slowly? Now, unfortunately, in 1924, Einstein didn't know about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle because it hadn't been published yet. <laughs> when he did finally know about it, he didn't much like it. But, um, but if, if, if he had known about it, he would have said, well, they don't actually stop. They go to a velocity that's as small as they can be, uh, given Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which, as it turns out, is really, really slow. But nobody had ever made a gas that cold and that, that dense. And laser cooling, while it was a good start, really was not good enough. But evaporative cooling, starting from laser cooling and then using evaporative cooling, these guys in Boulder uh, and then at MIT were able to do that. So teams in Boulder, Colorado and at MIT in, in Cambridge finally in 1995, 70 years after Einstein's prediction. And for that they got the 2001 uh, Nobel Prize for Physics. And using this process of evaporative cooling, Bose-Einstein condensation, they have gotten temperatures less than one nanokelvin, less than one billionth of a degree above absolute zero. Here's uh, 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 Eric Cornell, uh, Wolfgang Ketterle at MIT, Eric at, at NIST in Boulder, uh, Wolfgang Ketterle at, uh, at MIT, Carl Wyman uh, in Boulder. And this is, is a picture of the velocity distributions of the atoms as they went to Bose condensation. 400 billionths of a degree, the temperature was still too hot. But when they finally got down to 200 billionths of a degree, this big spike comes up, and that was the signature that showed that they had achieved this thing that people had been dreaming about for 70 years. <sighs> this whole process, laser cooling, Bose-Einstein condensation, and all sorts of the techniques that have been developed for making ultra-cold atoms have opened up a whole new uh, area of research that David talked about in his introduction. And this is one of the areas that we're studying intensively right now in this program here at KITP. But just to summarize now, where have we been on this odyssey of going to lower and lower temperatures? This is a, a logarithmic thermometer, a cartoon of a logarithmic thermometer. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that every tick mark on this thermometer is a factor of 10 change in temperature. 
At the top here, I've got a pretty hot temperature, the surface of the sun. It's not the hottest temperature there is, but it's pretty hot. 5,000 degrees. Room temperature is 300 degrees. Notice on this thermometer, room temperature is just a little bit cooler than the surface of the sun. And liquid nitrogen temperature, the coldest thing you've ever seen. Just a little bit colder than room temperature. Outer space, just a little bit colder than liquid nitrogen. The first experiments on laser cooling, 240 millionths of a degree, colder compared to outer space than outer space is compared to the surface of the sun. And that was just the start. Bose condensation, 50 nanokelvin in 1995. Today, below 500 picokelvin, less than one half of one billionth of a degree above absolute zero. Colder compared to the earliest experiments on laser cooling than outer space is compared to the surface of the sun by a lot. And that may just be the beginning. It may be that experiments in the uh, International Space Station sometime in the future will allow us to get down to one picocalvin. And at the program here at KITP right now, people are, are proposing new ideas to get down to temperatures much lower than this because we need those kinds of temperatures to do the, the kinds of experiments that we want to do. Well, just to give you another view of how cold it is, if this is a linear scale now with 300 degrees room temperature at the top, liquid nitrogen is down here, the temperatures we get here would be above zero by one one hundredth the size of an atom. That's how cold the temperatures are now and we're just beginning. We're going to get colder still. So what is next? Well, all sorts of wonderful things. We've already got better clocks. Uh, in Boulder, Colorado, neutral atoms are even better than these fountain clocks that I, uh, that, that I showed you. And trapped, atom, trapped ions are better still. We're using these things to do just the things that David said we were doing 30 years ago, except so much better, measuring fundamental constants and finding out, for example, whether the fundamental constants of nature are constant. This was the kind of question we couldn't ask before. But now our measurement instruments are so fine, we can ask questions like, are these constants the same? Do they change from one year to the next? And we can answer those questions with a kind of precision that has never been possible before. And so far, they seem to be constant, but we're pushing on these things because uh, uh, this really gets at our most fundamental understanding of the way nature works. Quantum simulation, this is one of the key things that we're talking about in the present program. Solving problems that we can state but we cannot solve on any computer. We can make the atoms solve the problem using cold atoms. Quantum computers, information stored in single atoms can be processed in ways that ordinary information cannot be processed. And as a result, you can solve problems that ordinary computers cannot solve. This is still a dream, but we're working on the, just the, the first steps of making these new kinds of information processing devices. And probably the most important thing is the one down here, the things we haven't thought of yet. Because it seems that every day when you open up a, a journal, every uh, day you go to a conference, you see something new, some wonderful new idea that, uh, that, that somebody comes up with. And uh, uh, for me, it's been a great thrill working with with young people from, from all over the world who come to our group with, with fantastic ideas and leave to go off to do more and more fantastic things. And there are groups all over the world represented by the international uh, uh, character of, of this group of ours in Gaithersburg. And for me, it's been an absolute thrill and an adventure to uh, play this game with such wonderful people, and I'm happy to have had a chance to share some of that adventure with you today. Thanks very much. So, of course, I'm happy to answer questions. I hope so. We have another one? I think there's two, yeah. So. Okay. Um, well, that was a great talk, as uh, and an unusual one. And <laughs> we need a new rug anyway. Yeah, we need a new. <laughs> ah, it'll all come out in the wash. <laughs>
Uh, and I'm sure Bill is, uh, Bill is delighted to, add, to answer questions, and I'm sure you all have some questions. So um, please wait for the microphone to arrive so that you can uh, be heard. And uh, there, wh where is the microphone? Where's the so there's one microphone over there, okay. and then there's the one you've so got. You deal with the people on that side. I'll <laughs> start with this. It seems a pretty trivial question after what you've been talking about, but how come the rubber balloons did not break, but the rubber ball did? Yeah, well, that's a really good question, in fact, and the answer is I'm not entirely sure, but let me tell you what I think. Anytime you get something that's really thin, then even though it might be stiff in a thicker version, it can be quite flexible. So take something like glass, a pretty brittle substance, right? Make it into a thin fiber and you can tie it in knots. So the balloon is a very thin sheet of rubber and as a result, even when it's uh, at liquid nitrogen temperature, it's still reasonably flexible. Sometimes these balloons do break. And I think that when, I guess, remarkably, none of these balloons actually popped. They often do. And I think the reason is that near where I tie them off, it's pretty thick. And there, as the thing starts to uh, thaw, you get some stresses and, uh, and it cracks there. At least that's my guess. I don't really know for sure. Ah, OK. <laughs> so, so sometimes that does happen. As you get more and more accurate clocks, is it possible you will hit a quantum limit in time itself? OK, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, first of all, the limits in the precision of our clocks are now essentially quantum limits. That is, the thing that sets what the, the precision of our clocks is, is quantum mechanics. When we ask, is the atom excited or is it not, in, uh, in a quantum mechanical world, uh, the answer is, well, uh, maybe and maybe not. <laughs> and so every atom that we shine the microwaves at may or may not make the transition. And if we have a million atoms and the probability of making the transition is 50%, then we'd think we'd get half a million. But quantum mechanics tells us there's going to be some, some uncertainty in that. And those uncertainties are exactly the thing that limit our ability to make measurements on those clocks. So in a certain sense, we're already at the quantum limits. And the way we beat the quantum, well, you don't beat the quantum limits, you just work with them. We just make measurements for longer times. We do a million atoms, then we do another million of atoms, and then we do another million atoms, and that's how we work with those kind of limits. But I suspect that your question was really slightly different. That is, if we can divide time into finer and finer pieces, do we reach some limit? Well, people have speculated that there might be limits to how finely time could be divided. Now, the fact of the matter is that making more accurate atomic clocks doesn't really get to those questions, at least not directly. Uh, usually, the kind of things that you might think would get to those kinds of questions would be the measurement of things happening on very short time scales. Whereas here, we're really asking about can we measure very long time intervals with really high precision? So it's not quite the same physics, but uh, it might very well be that the kind of precision with which things could be measured could get at the kinds of, uh, of questions about whether things, how things happen on very short time scales. Because as it turns out, uh, very often, the kinds of things that you want to study at very high energies, if you study them very precisely, you can do it by looking at, uh, at things on a lower energy scale uh, much more accurately. So it might be that there's some application, but for the moment, I haven't really thought about it carefully. Um, so uh, you talked about the accuracy of various clocks, you know, back to the, the Harrison's clock and, uh, you know, losing seconds per month down to seconds per millions of years. Uh, what forms the absolute standard that you know the accuracy of a clock? Right. So how do we know what a second is? And the answer is we pass a law. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, there's an international agreement that a second is a certain number of times that a cesium atom ticks. And for those of you who know what that means is it's a certain number of cycles of the hyperfine transition in the ground state of cesium. It's just basically when the cesium atom ticks 9 billion and some, some number of times, that's a second. 
and we've agreed by international agreement that that is what we mean by a second. So when we make a clock with cesium atoms, then we know we're doing the right thing. And the accuracy that I quote you is that people look at these things very carefully and say, what are all the things that could mess it up? Okay, let's think of something that could mess it up, a magnetic field. Let's crank up the magnetic field and see how it messes it up. And then let's ask ourselves, how big could the magnetic field be in our apparatus? Okay, and then uh, we know how much a bigger magnetic field does. We can calculate what the magnetic field we actually do have would do, or you know, the, at the best we can measure it, and we can put an uncertainty on that. And we do that for everything you can think of, and that's how you arrive at these uncertainties. And then somebody else in another laboratory across the Atlantic Ocean uh, does exactly the same thing, and you compare the two clocks. And if they agree to within the uncertainty that you calculated in this way, then you say, okay, we did our job reasonably well. And if they don't, you say, hmm, maybe we forgot something. And we're now at the stage where these things agree pretty well and people think that the numbers that I've told you are probably pretty good. Since the cosmic microwave background permeates everything, shouldn't it be getting inside your vacuum chamber ah. and setting a lower limit there? Yeah, it's worse than that. Because inside our vacuum chamber is not the, just the cosmic microwave background, it's room temperature. So we have a, a, a background radiation that is much hotter than the cosmic microwave background radiation, and it doesn't do a thing to our atoms. This drives real, temper, real low temperature physicists crazy. Because you know, a real low temperature physicist would do all their experiments inside several layers of doers. There would be liquid nitrogen on the outside, and there would be liquid helium on the inside, and there would be all kinds of, of shiny surfaces to reflect the, uh, the light trying to come in from the outside to heat everything up. We don't need any of that. Our thing is sitting out in the middle of room temperature with really hot room temperature shining on it, and it doesn't make it any difference at all. Why not? Because our cold material is a gas. And a gas will only absorb radiation of just the right color. And there's almost none of it around. Whereas a solid will absorb practically anything that falls on it. So all that radiation coming in from room temperature is deadly to the kinds of solids that real low temperature physicists use or other condensed materials, liquid solids. You, you shine something on it, it absorbs that, uh, that radiation and it heats up. So you've got to be so careful. We can be just blasé about these kinds of things. It just doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Um. I have a question about the four satellites that are orbiting. And you stated that they all are synchronized. Yeah. So my question is, how do you synchronize ah. the time? And then how, how do you deal with the relativistic effect? <laughs> how fast do these very, very cold clocks you're making have to be moving in order for you to experience or, or measure a relativistic effect? Yeah, so, okay, so let me, let me answer the last question first. When the global positioning system was being uh, put into service, the engineers who had developed it weren't entirely sure about how to make the general relativity corrections. Everybody was sure about the special relativity corrections. So let me explain what that means. In 1905, Einstein comes up with special relativity. It's, it's basically a theory that tells how I should look at things that are moving at a constant velocity relative to each other. And you have these things where moving clocks run slower. That is, if I'm sitting here and a clock's moving past me at a constant velocity, I think that clock is running slower. They knew how to take that into account, and they had to take it into account. It's a huge effect for the global positioning system. They weren't sure how to take the general relativity uh, into account. General relativity is a theory that Einstein came up with in about 1915 or 16 that is basically a new theory of gravity. Now, the satellites are up there, you know, at a different uh, height above the Earth. They're experiencing a different gravitational field. And how you take that into account, they weren't entirely sure. So they had two different programs, one taking the general relativity corrections into account and one not taking the general relativity corrections into account. After one day, it was clear that they absolutely had to include the general relativity corrections. They'd be off by a kilometer. So. In 1915, or 16, when Einstein came up with general relativity, it was reported in the newspapers that this theory was so arcane that there were only three people in the world who could understand it. Okay? In fact, 
an interesting story, apparently true, is that one of those guys was Sir Arthur Eddington. And according to the story, some friend comes to see Eddington and says, see here, Eddington it says in the newspaper that only three people in the world understand Einstein's theory. And Eddington says, well, I don't know about that. And the friend says, come now, Eddington, don't be so modest. And he said, no, no, I was wondering who the third person might be. <laughs> so so uh, uh, if, if you didn't understand, if somebody didn't understand general relativity today, the global positioning system just wouldn't work at all. And you know, you can use the global positioning system to find your car in a parking lot, right? <laughs> so, uh, so, so it's big time. Relativity corrections are really big time in the global positioning system. How do they synchronize it? Well, this is another place where cold atoms are coming in because they're synchronized using ground clocks and tracking stations. And those Ground clocks are now being uh, controlled by laser-cooled clocks because those are the clocks that every uh, really important clock laboratory in the world is using laser-cooled clocks as their standards. And so that's actually helping to improve what's called the ephemeris, the, the knowledge of where those satellites are by tracking them better using these really good clocks and, of course, synchronizing them at the same time. So all this stuff goes together. As far as the details, I haven't a clue. But <laughs> <laughs> All right. If if time is what is measured by clocks, does time exist in the absence of a clock? Ah. And if it does, what is it in terms of physics? Boy, what what great questions! That exact question has led people to to speculate that time essentially becomes meaningless as you go back in time to the very early uh, universe at times that are on the or I don't remember what, 10 to the minus 36 seconds after the Big Bang. Uh, well, you're talking about the Planck time. But even at longer times than the Planck time, you still don't have any structures of matter that could have energy levels that could conceivably be used to make a clock. And so people have suggested that there is no time, even for a certain amount of time after the Big Bang. So, so if we don't have anything that we could use as a ticker, then maybe we don't have anything like time. But you know, you might say, well, 10 to the minus 36 seconds. Who cares? But you know, I mean, it's still, it's not zero, right? Uh, but but after that, you've got things. You've got things that could at least, in principle, be used as tickers. And so, at least in principle, you can think about what the time would be. So there's, well, no, but see, this is all being recorded for posterity. <laughs> um. Is there anything about uh, this, your study of time that tells you whether or not the perceived direction of time that, that ah. we consciously experience is inherent in, in the dimension? And, and uh, next, uh, referring to the Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen paradox, <laughs> when you have entangled quantum state particles that seem to act independent of time, what does that tell you about the reality of time? Okay. <laughs> Boy, you get really good questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe I should just pass this off to David. <laughs> okay. So so there's two two really interesting questions here. One has to do with the arrow of time. Now, I don't believe that measuring time more and more accurately in a direct way will tell us something about the arrow of time, but as for other things, measuring things more precisely might be able to tell us something about the nature of time and its direction. So for example, for many, many years, people thought that the laws of physics were symmetric with respect to a change in the direction of time. We now know that that's not so. And the degree to which it's not so is really, really tiny, at least as far as we can tell. But experiments that are being done using cold atoms might reveal some violations of this time reversal symmetry that are bigger than the ones we know about now. And if that 
becomes the case, it might teach us something important about this failure of this symmetry. And that the failure of that symmetry might have something to do with the arrow of time, although that is a very debatable thing. A lot of people would say, that's all garbage. The, the arrow of time is just a purely statistical thing. Okay? The fact that time goes in one direction, the fact that you, you drop a racquetball on a, a concrete block and it breaks and the, the things don't reassemble and back up, that's purely statistical. There's nothing prevents that from happening from the laws of physics. It's just that the probability of that happening is really small and it's those statistics that give us the arrow of time. But certainly not everybody believes that. So. Uh, whether these kinds of experiments will answer those questions, I don't know. But I think that they will give us a few more pieces of the puzzle that will allow us to think more completely about those questions. I don't think that fi finding a more severe violation of time reversal is going to answer these questions. But I think that it'll, it'll at least give us one more piece of the puzzle. Now, the other thing was Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen. <laughs> OK, first of all, I'm guessing that 95% of the people here have never heard of Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, uh, three uh, physicists of the, uh, of the 20th century. One of them you've heard of. <laughs> and a few of you have heard of the other two. Um, OK. Uh, Einstein, as you may know, never much cared for quantum mechanics. He didn't like the idea that this most fundamental theory describing the way the world works extremely successfully is a probabilistic theory. He just was famously quoted as saying that he didn't believe that God played at dice with the universe. Uh, and he kept trying to come up with ways of showing that there were difficulties with quantum mechanics. And one of the most famous and perhaps most troubling ways that he came up with for showing a potential difficulty with quantum mechanics was contained in this einstein podolsky rosen paper of 1935, which I think was largely ignored at the time, but today uh, is perhaps one of the most uh, cited uh, ideas because of things like quantum computing that we're, uh, that we're working on now, because it has to do with this thing that you mentioned, entanglement. So let me try to give a not, not the way they did it, but the way that other people have thought about it since then. Imagine I've got a composite particle that's made up of a particle that is uh, up and another particle that's down. And, and the thing about this is that uh, these are, let's imagine these are two indistinguishable particles. And now they're going to fly apart. Okay, And one of them is going to be up and one of them is going to be down. But I got no idea whether the up one's going to go that way or the down one's going to go that way. Right Now over here, I'm going to have a detector. Okay? And I'm going to detect whether the thing is up or down. Now nobody could possibly predict whether this thing is going to be up or down at the time that I detect it. But as soon as I detect it, I know what the result's going to be over there. Now this is an oversimplified version. Uh, so all of you physicists who know that I'm telling lies, just give me a break. Uh, but, but basically what Einstein says, how could that be? How could... Uh, what happens here affect what's going on over there instantaneously. Why doesn't it have to take at least the time for light to travel that distance? It doesn't, OK? Uh, but what it shows is, what, basically what Einstein said was, if this is true, and this is what quantum mechanics predicts, that this would happen. He says, if that's true, then all of our concept about the nature of reality has got to be wrong. Reality t our, our nature of reality says that, that if we have something here, that the properties of this thing that's here have to do with what's going on here, not with what's going on over there. Just makes sense, right? Well, it turns out it makes sense, but it's wrong. And you can do an experiment. And people have done experiments, and in fact, one of the most uh, famous of those experiments done by one of the participants in our uh, in our program right here. Alain Aspey is one of the people who has done uh, the most careful of these kinds of experiments showing that quantum mechanics was right and Einstein was wrong. And uh, this still mystifies people. That is, how can there be this sort of communication between what's happening here and what's happening there faster than the uh, the speed of light? And the answer is, there is no communication. Uh, it's just that, that the 
existence of reality is something that doesn't depend just on what's happening locally. There's a non-local reality. Now this seems to be going against our general notions of the way things work, but in fact it seems to be the way nature works, that, that nature is non-local. And you know, some people have made all sorts of philosophical uh, claims about this, you know, that somehow this is consistent with uh, Eastern uh, mysticism or something. I don't much buy any of that, but it does seem to be the way the world works, that we have this, this feature uh, of the way the world works that is uh, against our common sense, yet it is the way things work. So I'm not sure if that really answers your question. The fact of the matter is, nobody is satisfied with the answers to these kinds of questions. Have I, uh, have I done any kind of justice to this, David? <laughs> Remember, I'm an experimentalist. <laughs> I think the mic is heading your way. <laughs> Just a quick, quick question here. You mentioned that ions are better than neutral ad atoms. Why is that? Yeah, so it's not so much that they're ions, which is, say, electrically charged atoms. It's that they were using an optical frequency as the ticking frequency. And in general, if you can tick faster, you're better off. And the reason is that there are certain kinds of problems that are going to give you a constant error. And so if your ticking frequency is higher, then that constant frequency error is going to be a smaller fraction of your ticking frequency, and therefore you're going to be better off. And that's the key reason why the ions are better, is because they're using a, uh, a higher ticking frequency. There are some technical things that they're better isolated from uh, other kinds of, uh, of influences than, than atoms because you hold them in traps that basically guarantee the fields are zero where the ions are held, as long as you do your job right. So there's some other things that make them a little bit better, but it's mainly the ticking frequency is faster. There's one over there. Um, you've talked about some amazing measurements of time and temperature. Do you have a feel for the state of the art in measuring distance? Huh. What's the smallest thing we can measure? Okay, yeah. Well, well, let me not quite answer that. But measuring distance is now intimately related to measuring time. And that's because at some time, not that long ago, we redefined what a meter was in the following way. Before the redefinition, okay, let me just go back in history a little bit. In 1875, the meter was defined as being the distance between two scratches on a platinum iridium rod. And uh, everybody who was a signatory of the Convention du Maître in 1875 got a copy of this meter bar, and the United States was one of those signatories. So we have been on the metric system since 1875. All of our measurements are in terms of the metric system since 1875. Why no one ever noticed this, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> OK, so that was what the definition of the meter was up until sort of uh, somewhere midway in the 20th century where it was defined in terms of the wavelength of light of a certain lamp of cadmium, I think it was, that had a certain very pure yellow color. And they used that as the standard of, of, uh, of length. And then it turned out that that pure color wasn't that pure. And then they thought, well, let's define it in terms of a laser wavelength. And then they thought again and said, let's do something a little bit more clever. Let's define the meter as being the distance that light travels in vacuum in a certain length of time. And that became the definition of the meter. That means that the speed of light is defined. You know, so, so uh, for many years people were measuring the speed of light. You can't measure the speed of light anymore. It's a given number by law. <laughs> and you cannot exceed the speed of light by law, both law of nature <laughs> and the international uh, law of international agreement. So all this business about time does have an awful lot to do with length. But when you ask questions about the shortest length that you can measure, it doesn't have much to do with 
precision timekeeping. It has to do with, uh, of, of the sort that I'm talking about, it has to do with basically dividing time up into smaller and smaller intervals, which isn't the same thing. That is, I don't have to divide time into really small intervals to make a really good clock. I just have to run the clock for a really long time and be sure that, that any other clock being run for a similarly long time will count the same number of ticks. But you know, even though it's not my specialty, there, there I do know that there has been a tremendous uh, amount of uh, um, progress in measuring smaller and smaller distances. But the question of what's the smallest distance that's been measured really depends upon what you mean by that. Because there's a, an, so many different senses in which you might measure those small distances. One is you might make a really short pulse of light. And then that pulse of light will have a very tiny distance. But you might do other things. You, like, you, you might measure something like what is the size of an electron? Well, it turns out that the size of an electron, as far as we can tell, is zero, which is kind of an amazing thing because it has all these properties like mass and spin and magnetic moment, and its size is zero. Some of the measurements you make on the electron that tell you what its size is uh, are things that basically put a limit on how big it might be. So that, in a, in a sense, is another way of measuring a very small size, is by measuring, does the electron have any internal structure? That's really what we're talking about. And so far, we haven't seen any. And the ability to say that there is no internal structure of the electron, that it has no size, is limited by precision measurements that relate to the same kinds of precision measurements we do to make clocks, although not exactly. And so that's another way in which you might measure uh, a really small distance. Another thing you might ask is, um, is the charge distribution of, a, uh, of an electron identical to its mass distribution? Is there an offset? That would create a, a dipole moment. Well. Uh, so far, nothing, but the degree to which you can say that there is no dipole moment of the electron is another way of saying that you've measured a really tiny distance. I don't remember at all what these numbers are. Do you remember what these, some of them, I mean, they're incredibly small. Minus 18 centimeters. Oh, more, more, smaller than that. But maybe, maybe somebody, is there any physicist who works in this area who remembers what these numbers are? Electron dipole moment would, would, would be like an e centimeter. I mean, I think that in e centimeter. Yeah, I think it's more like 10 to the minus 33 e centimeters or something like that. Yeah. So there's another one back there, and then one over there. <laughs> you people have really good questions. It's, uh, <laughs> I guess that's what comes from being in a university town, right? That you. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> okay. So, so in fact, in a certain sense, we live in a four-dimensional world, or at least a three plus one-dimensional world. And as you indicate by your question, there are uh, a number of theories floating around that want to have more than three plus one dimensions. Uh, and uh, and you might even ask, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> how, how could there be, you know, what does that even mean to say that there, there's more than the three spatial dimensions that we have? Well, I haven't a clue. Uh, but uh, I'm sure David could give a much better exposition of this. But, but part of the reason why we don't experience these three, anything more than the three dimensions that we, that we have, is that these other dimensions are folded up so tightly that we can't see them. Now, how tightly? Well, the idea is that some of them might not be folded up all that tightly, and you might be able to see the effects of the fact that they're not folded up quite so tightly by making really precision measurements. So now we're back to the, the precision measurement thing. So it might be that some of these really highly, precision, highly precise measurements could have something to say about those things. Don't hold your breath, but it's possible. <laughs> So I think there was another question over here. <laughs> Getting back to the director of Earth rotation. <laughs> now that you have really, really, really stable clocks, what kind of uh, frequencies or what kind of short-term influences do you see in the Earth's rotation? Yeah. Well, um, things like a, an earthquake or a tsunami 
don't really have a whole lot of effect. They affect the uh, Earth, the, the length of a day by something on the order of a microsecond. So over a year, it doesn't even add up to a millisecond. There, I think some of the big things are, are ocean currents. The changes in ocean currents, there's a tremendous amount of mass involved in, in, in ocean currents. And so the kinds of changes that happen are order of a second per year. A year is about three times 10 to the seven seconds, about 30 million seconds in a year. So the kinds of effects that, that are seen are on the order of one in 30 million or less or more, depending upon what's happened that year. So for example, for a whole, for a number of years, we were getting a leap second about every year, which basically meant that the Earth's rotation rate was uh, about the uh, about constant over that time, just a little bit off from the atomic time. And then we went for about 10 years without any leap seconds. So something changed in the Earth's rotation rate there, and we didn't have any leap seconds at all, and it got to be just about right. And then recently we were back to having leap seconds. So uh, I'm not sure exactly what it is that caused those things, because of course we're not really privy to everything that's going on in the Earth. <laughs> But but that's the the order of magnitude of what's. Uh, uh, oh yeah, it's just that nobody kept track of it that well before. Well yeah, so but that, that's right. So 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 we 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 can see smaller changes uh, now than 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 before. And as to whether people are able to correlate these things with geophysical things, that I don't know. I know that it's very hard to see the effect of something like a single earthquake, even when it's a really big one. Uh, now, along those same lines, you might be interested, there is a controversy raging right now as to whether we should continue to do leap seconds. Because uh, people who want to keep atomic time and keep GPS going, what's these leap seconds all about? Why should we have that? But the astronomers want to dial up their instruments and say what time it is, and we don't have leap seconds, then noon isn't noon anymore for them. You know, Right now we're guaranteeing that noon is always noon within better than a second. So the astronomers can, uh, can uh, go in their merry way and, and dial up their, uh, their, their, their telescopes, and they're going to have to keep track uh, of of these leap seconds that aren't happening if we don't, uh, if we stop doing leap seconds. So there's a real uh, argument raging as to whether we should keep doing leap seconds. And of course, there's the other issue that, you know, uh, if we wait for, a, for, you know, a few tens of thousands of years, we might be off by enough that anybody might actually be able to tell that it's not noon, you know? <laughs> so, but, you know, we're not going to be around then, so what do we care? <laughs> Okay, I think maybe we should um, we should cut this off and give Bill a rest, and let's thank him again for a marvelous. Thank you. thank you very much. One brief announcement: in January we'll have our next public lecture, and illustrating the diversity of the KITP, this will be on how bacteria communicate. Uh, by Bonnie Bassler, uh, and uh, hope to see you then, January 18th, I think. There are refreshments in the common room. <laughs> what a great crowd. <laughs>